Deion Sanders, Jackson State tenure ended with a loss in the Celebration Bowl. That, that Very one entertaining game. Poor guy dropping the pass in overtime. He's, he's never living that down. We will, uh, we will decline from identifying his demographics, but it was a tough drop and a tough situation. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, David. Maybe <laughs> I think you can say it. I can't say that. So We'll just say it was, it was a moment. If you're going to that... be that guy, don't drop that pass. It's, that's, it's true. That's all I, I can did, say. The, the clip of Dion consoling him in the locker room after the game did go somewhat viral on, on, uh, on Sunday. It was interesting. It was interesting to see, which will so tap let, into let, something what we're talking about. Let's talk, Dion, though, because you, you did a story <laughs> where you talked to a bunch of people around the program at Jackson State mm -hmm. to go inside what Dion's program looked like at Jackson State to give people an idea of what Dion's program at Colorado might look like. And it, it's a really good story. If you haven't read it on The Athletic, I, I recommend everybody read it. But, David, for, for those who are just listening right now, Give us a little little taste of it. Well, I think there's this idea because Dion did not come up in a traditional way. He doesn't have the so-called coaching mentors. He wasn't a running backs coach and then a coordinator and then got a job. He coached a little bit in high school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, was an OC at a small private school. There was the prime prep saga, all that stuff, and then – he was the head coach of Jackson State. And I think there's this belief that, well, he doesn't, he hasn't paid his dues. He doesn't know what he's doing. His program, you know, he just brings these kids in and they just roll the ball out there and they just let them go to work. I think there's that perception of the Dion program, fair or not. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to talk to people like, how does he actually run his program? And I think what I was struck with is he has some certain, some little signatures that he does, and you can see those in the story. But Andy, it, it was remarkably unremarkable in that they – I've been around a lot of different programs. They run a lot like every other program, Andy. Yeah, he has other – there's other coaches on staff. It's not just Dion, and some of those guys have come up in a more traditional way. And he well, seems I, smart enough to be able to rely on the people who have the experience that he lacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. There's two main tenets of Dion's program is that, for one, you know, he was selling the HBCU dream, which certainly prompted a lot of the criticism of him leaving Jackson State. He was saying, hey, listen, HBCUs have been cast aside for a long time. Come here. Help us rebuild that. That was a powerful pitch. That's a big reason why he got Travis Hunter. Travis Hunter can do things at Jackson State that he cannot do at Florida State. And we'll see. I'm not so sure that Travis Hunter is, is going to just sort of, you know, walked his way back into the power five. I think that meant something to him. And I think obviously he has a relationship with TC Taylor, who is going to be the new coach there. That was one um, half of the, the, the cell. There's the coach prime effect. He's a magnetic personality. He really resonates with kids. And that was one of the things that I <clears throat> wanted to talk to when I talked to guys that had played for him is like, why do you care about him? He, you are 18, 19. He played, Long, I don't know when he'd retired. I mean, it was a while ago. It was Everybody else that gonna... played in his era has been forgotten from yeah. this standpoint. And yeah. yet you still care about him. And I think guys just still idolize him. I think there's the swag element of it, the jewelry. The, I think the I think their dads him. idolize him. Yeah, a there's, lot an, of them. there's an element of that. Um, but he does resonate. And you can say he doesn't or complain about why he does, but the reality is that he does. And there's that effect for recruiting. And then, of course, there's the, hey – I'm the best ever at my position. I know what it's like to be in the NFL. I've been through what you come, what you've been through. I can get you to the next level. And here's my staff that's got a bunch of NFL experience on the field um, and in coaching. So we're going to get you to the next level. It, SC Scott, I honestly don't think Dion is that good of an X and O coach. I think he was just able to accumulate talent massively out talent as opponents. So basically, Dabo Sweeney. Because that's you just described Dabo that, Sweeney. Right that there. I think is that's what we're going to find out. That's that's yeah, what we're I mean, going to find out. Yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> that I think is the most interesting part of Dion going to Colorado is that the reality is he had a middle of the road G5 probably caliber roster made with some stars on top of that. Shadur Sanders, obviously Travis right. Hunter, which in the SWAC is going in to dominate. The, yes. And so, yeah, like the guys that I talked to were, yeah, we were just more talented than other people. Well, that's his entire pitch at Colorado. Well, but what does it look like when his talent isn't that much better, but also how much talent can he get at Colorado? And I don't think we have the answer to either well, of those you know questions. The and that's part of why this this whatever the, the Deion Sanders saga at Colorado ends up being, it's going to be fascinating, and there's going to be a ton of eyes on it. And Colorado has not been this relevant since, dare I say, 1990. So, listen, 
The over-under for the season win totals next year, do you know what it is? You want to play the game, I guess? It, or I believe know? it's five and a half. I, five I, and I, a half. Uh, yeah. So, like, if people are sitting here thinking that, like, this is going to be, like, a playoff team next year. Well, like you're, well, you're misunderstanding. Now, I'll say this, Ari. I don't think you're a playoff team, but wasn't the USC over-under, like, seven and a half or eight and a half? Yeah, yeah. It was eight and a half. Um, so I don't think Dion is Lincoln Riley, but I'll just tell you, based on when you look at who is? But USC also had Notre Dame on their schedule in their non-conference. I don't know well, who call, sure, Colorado sure. opens with who again? TCU and Nebraska. TCU, they got, and, Nebraska. They Nebraska. TCU yeah, and they host tough. Nebraska. Yeah. So here's the thing: the reality is that Colorado, when you look in the transfer board and you look at who is, well, I'm le- I'm in the portal. Here's what I'm looking at: Colorado is on lists that you would never expect. Because well, and and, and so Travis Hunter's probably going to go there. That's one. We, yeah, we'll see. That's a big part yeah. of it. Um, yeah. But well, what do they you think he's going to do? That's what Dion said. We'll find out. We'll see. Um, but ultimately, you know, they they can they can do some things and 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 maybe they're gonna be better than people think. I, I think But I think eight wins would be better than what people think. I think well, that's but that's something I think that's that's not insane to me. That, yeah, that no, they it's were not the, insane. No. They were the worst team in the power five. This I would year. bet the over right now if I if I was betting on eight and a half? On five and, and a half. Oh yeah, five and a half. I absolutely would. Right we we, yeah, we were we were putting Lance Leipold on Coach of the Year list for taking over the worst Power Five program in the country and, and making it bowl and If anybody can do it quickly, so, it's Dion. Yeah. If, now if, here's the thing, though. If Colorado's bowl eligible next year, that's that's all. That's fine. But I, I will say this, and Ari Ari and I have talked about this. If he can accumulate talent, which I, I think he will, he can be in the top third of the league just by accumulating enough talent based on what the league will be starting in 2024. Like a USC list Pac-12, if you've got players, you're going to win eight games a year. I got and let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not gloss over the fact that the Dion effect, whatever that looks like, there's not a lot of people that get sitting G5 coaches to come be an OC for you. Like mm-hmm. that is an unbelievable thing. Like I think the last guy to do that was what, Pete Lembo? Maybe. Uh, Dan, Dan, Enos. Dan Enos. Dan Enos from Central Michigan, Alabama. That does not so happen that's, very often. Well, it's going to start happening more often because Sean yes. Lewis had been trying to get Power 5 head coaching jobs, was mm-hmm. stuck at Kent State. He's more marketable. So he's, he's going to get more money at Colorado. Mm-hmm. And if their offense is good, he'll get all the credit. And, mm-hmm. and he'll get hired for a Power 5 job. And that's somebody asked me on my mailbag last week. They're like, that seems like an odd path. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, only if... <laughs> Getting more money and getting closer to where you actually want to be is odd to you because, mm-hmm. and then I did the list of the, the coaches that have gone from power five coordinator to power five head coach and power five or a group of five head coach to power five head coach. Mixed bag, Nin- I'm guessing. In the last four years, 19 power five coordinators have, have become power five head coaches and 12 group of five head coaches have become power five head coaches. I was trying to remember the last, the last coach. Cause like, the last one who jumped from the Sun Belt to a Power Five job was was Billy, Billy Napier, Napier going yeah. Louisiana to Florida. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember. I, I couldn't remember off the top of my head the last Matt coach who jumped to a Power Five head coaching uh, job. It's been a while. It has been a while. I'm trying to think. The Mac hasn't had that Wonderkin. Is it? It's not PJ Fleck, is it? It is. is it, been, it is. It is PJ Fleck. Wow. Yep. I covered their bowl game at Western Michigan. Corey Davis, shout out. Yeah. So here's the thing about Deion Sanders at Colorado. There are a lot of elements, and everybody knows me as the stars matter do, but there are a lot of elements to winning football at a, at a program, right? You got culture, correct hires, ability to make it through tough times, a.k.a. Uh, the cliche of adversity. But there's one thing that there's a lot of things that you can doubt that Dion will be able to handle. How good is he of an X's and O's coach? Will he listen to his assistants? All these things that you could say could be the reason why this goes off the rails. But the one thing that I think all three of us can agree on is that like they have no doubt whatsoever that he's going to get dudes there, right? No, I, I have no doubts about that. I, if I, you have no what, what doubts about him getting dudes somewhere, that's 85% of the job. And yeah. like that is the whole thing. The, the reason why he is a hireable person isn't because of the YouTube channel. Well, maybe some some of it is to make it more recognizable, Mm -hmm. but it's the faith that this person can bring in a level of talent that could not go to this program in previous years. That's it. That's the whole thing. I I think it's it's weird. Like, I read the comments on any story we do involving Dion and David's was no different. First thing, Mm -hmm. why aren't you doing an investigation of Prime Prep? Well, The Athletic didn't exist when Prime Prep did, but a lot of other media outlets did, and they they covered it very thoroughly. The Dallas Morning News did a fantastic story. There's... There's not a lot of meat left on that bone. And I think the prime prep thing is interesting. You know, that was pretty inexcusable. It was bad. Dion's not the chancellor of Colorado. I don't know. Like, 
I don't know what people. Well, they might make him. They might make him the chancellor. Yeah, in time. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But like, I, you know, like it was really bad, and it did not work out. And they, they, they did a lot of things that uh, were not taking ownership of of what was a failure. But I, you know, I don't think to say that this is a different endeavor is to excuse or cast aside that. I just think that happened. I don't think that's a secret. Right. I don't think he's, I don't think people are overlooking yeah. it. I don't think Hugh, people are forgotten Hugh about just it. just got a, another head coaching job. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like it's a pretty forgiving business if you win and get players. Mm-hmm. So two weeks ago, you this know, is in, the most important the other thing. Order. <laughs> two weeks yeah. ago, I asked Andy on the show, and I'm happy that you're here now, David, to, to weigh in, mm-hmm. of whether or not Deion Sanders was going to be a heel of the sport. Mm-hmm. And when I wrote the story, too, was it last weekend about the first four star that committed to him? Dylan Edwards, yeah. The a Kansas lot of the comments were, "Can't wait for the House of Cards to fall." This guy's yeah, a fraud. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Mm-hmm. What is it? Why? Why do you think people seem to not like him or are rooting for him to fail more so than any other first year coach? Maybe outside of Lincoln Riley, who was the ultimate heel last year. Like, mm-hmm. but Oklahoma fans were rooting. Yeah, for yeah, Riley. right. Fans right. of other schools didn't care. I don't think people cared. Yeah, people were just okay. like, "Oh, Lincoln's good coach. We'll see." Um, I th- I don't think it's one thing, Ari. I I think I think it is that he jumped the line in a lot of mm-hmm. ways that he didn't pay his dues. Like that's part of it. I think that he doesn't talk like other coaches. He doesn't say a lot of like coach speak. I think for whatever you want to make of the way that he, um, you know, conducts himself or runs his program and, and whether or not that is um, calculated or short sighted or whatever you want to say, um, we haven't seen a coach like Dion in college football. And I think he opens himself up to criticism. And I think in the same breath, I don't think he cares about it, which is actually unique to a lot of coaches because he keeps doing things that people might criticize well, him for. Whether imagine, it's not... imagine you were the greatest cornerback who ever lived. Would you care what anybody thought about anything? Well, you did? And, I, and, 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 and for what it's worth, I think we should also discuss that all the stuff that annoys people about him is stuff that probably doesn't matter. Okay, he thought he got robbed his first game at Jackson State. It ends up right. that there was like a mix up. Okay. He wants a reporter to call him coach sure. because like okay, whatever you want to say that about that. That was just stupid. Yeah, but <laughs> like that doesn't that doesn't matter. It affects yeah. people's opinions, but but it doesn't actually matter. It certainly doesn't matter inside the locker room. And I think that's what fuels a lot of the perception. And I will say, you know, I and when I, you know, when Dion was first, first coming along the scene, I thought, well, this kind of seems, you know, it's tougher for black coaches to get jobs in this business. And, you know, there's a lot of other people that have paid their dues. And I was kind of like, eh, that kind of, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But I've talked to a lot of black coaches over the last year and a half since Dion has kind of been having his rise. And every single black, I'm telling you, I have not talked to one black coach who said something more different than this. They just say the same thing. Hey, we're rooting for him because if he succeeds, there's more seats at the table for well, and 